welcome to what has been a very long time since we have done an investment committee podcast. And those of you watching on video can see that uh, we are at five different locations. I don't know if you're seeing it on the video the same way I'm seeing it on my screen or not. I'm sitting here at my study at my house in Newport Beach, California, where I've been working all day long for about six weeks. It looks like my partner, Brian, is out at his place in Park City. Is that right, Brian? Yes, I am. Been here a few weeks and I've uh, been working from the office here. And, and you got a picture behind you there of some of the, the wildlife of, uh, of Utah there, right? The Mountain West. That's, that's yeah, it's quite, quite, you can't see the room, but it's uh, quite west, westernly themed, I guess. <laughs> good. good. Uh, then over next to me is Julian Frazo, our director of equity research at his home near the beach. Julian, uh, working away. We're in middle earnings season on calls with analysts every day. What did we have? I think we had eight companies that released this last week and we have nine now here in the next few days. Yeah. In the total for this week is the, is the biggest one. It's the, it's the busy week of the season. I think in total it's going to be like 14, but there's already, there were three today. There's another four to more, I think. And then, you know, uh, as you said, another nine by the end of the week. So yeah, very busy. So a lot, a lot of uh, our companies uh, releasing earnings and we're going to comment on that in a second. I have a couple of questions for Julian about it without talking about any individual companies. Um, but of course, it's also the heaviest week for the whole S&P 500. I believe 200 of the S&P constituents are reporting over this week. So that is all moving along as well. Uh, and then below me in our little Brady Bunch box and over to the left is Robert Graham. And Robert, I got a strong feeling that you are actually at the office uh, unless you have a Bonson Group sign at your house. Tell us what you're doing there. I, I might have a Bonson Group sign at my house, but you are right. I am, uh, I am at the office practicing some social distancing from my, uh, my two energetic little boys. So. Yes, well, I, uh, I envy your, your decision there and, and uh, commend you. So good, good. Good to have somebody checking in on the office and uh, keeping everything moving there. Uh, Dea, how are you doing there in the middle? Doing good, doing good. I'm also in the office, although uh, Robert's uh, on, on the other other side of the hallway there. So there's about 50 feet of distance between us. So I, 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 I'm certain we should be okay. I'm certain as well. Well, it's good to have all of us together. Um, there's been an awful lot of, of Dividend Cafe communications and COVID and market communications. Um, that obviously, you guys are all reading and that we're sending out to clients and and people who follow the Bonson Group's material and, and viewpoint. Uh, and I think we've had uh, an extraordinary need to continue being uh, highly engaged in markets and, and creating a lot of this content we're creating. But right now, as we all sit here from our different remote locations, um, I thought we'd spend our time today on the podcast uh, kind of giving clients an idea, not merely of what we've already really been presenting over and over and that is so core to everything, you know, the basic kind of reiteration of our behavioral principles, the reiteration of, of our, our aversion to market timing, the sort of necessity of, of asset allocating throughout this period. Um, those reminders and those principles, we've, I believe, as an investment committee, done a very good job at consistently reiterating through this now, let's call it two-month period of market turmoil. And yet I do believe that there's some appetite for us to talk a bit about maybe some more opportunistic areas, some things that we think tactically in the present environment might be uh, getting attention from us, being implemented into client portfolios and, and uh, areas that the present state of dislocations has perhaps provided an opportunity uh, that, that is a bit more attractive. And so... I'll, I'll kind of um, tee it up myself, and then we'll we'll sort of rotate around. I I, I want to turn to you, Brian, in a moment, because um, you and I have been obviously invested in this space in different ways since the financial crisis, which was the time period where where I chose to try to learn a lot about the world of structured credit, and and I think that right now um, you've seen stocks really rebound quite a bit from their uh, March lows. There's still plenty of room to go and there's still plenty of pockets of tremendous opportunity in the equity markets. But I wonder if one could say for the most um, 
risk tolerant and opportunistic of investors that structured credit is perhaps over a three, six, nine month timeline where some of the most outsized returns could be found. And, I, and by structured credit, and by the way, in this week's Dividend Cafe, I've written already uh, a pretty extraordinary amount of material on this space to really try to provide a deeper dive into what we mean by structured or securitized credit. But when you look at the commercial mortgage-backed world, when you look at uh, the asset-backed securities, um, you look at these high-yield spreads, do you see um, a value trap, a death trap as the economy inevitably you know, fights through a recession? Or do you see an opportunity for, our, uh, for investors who have the risk appetite for it? No, I, I definitely see the opportunity there. I mean, you had, you know, in March, and I'm, I'm sure you, you'll relate too. I mean, it, it was reminiscent for me of the financial crisis where you basically had just this massive unwind of leverage in the system. And, you know, it was sort of everything being sold. There were no buyers, and whether it was a high grade corporate or even treasuries or agencies, or gubbies. I mean, you know, the, the, you know everything sold off and, 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 and nothing more so than some of those sectors that you mentioned, which is that securitized credit, uh, some non-agency commercial mortgage-backed securities, just some more esoteric, not illiquid stuff that you know had to catch a bid at a lower price. And it, it reminds me of a similar opportunity, um, maybe not quite as, as big, but a similar opportunity in the financial crisis where you had you know TARP that came out and you had these basically this big pool of money be able to you know, sop up all these assets from the banks that were just shedding assets at the time at 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And all those funds, you know, you know, obviously recouped and did very well. And I think the opportunity is similar there. Um, there's downgrades throughout that credit space. And some downgrades are going to be warranted. And some of those, some of those, you know, tranches may not perform, but then there's going to be things that are downgraded that will ultimately perform. And if you are able to sift through and really analyze those credits, it's a great risk-adjusted reward, um, and and that's one of the things we've been talking a lot about. Now, Brian, um, are, we're not going to sit and 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 go through those risk-adjusted credits, the underwriting, the credit fundamentals. So, talk a little bit about the criteria we'd have for the the managers we'd pick to go into that space, without mentioning the, some of these managers. Uh, and really, we don't even actually have to get into the LP side of it. I'll just sort of get it out of the way. There's hedge funds structured as limited partnerships that um, would be really where some of the most phenomenal talent lies in this space, but, but not every investor is going to be eligible there. They're probably going to be long and short. They're probably going to have leverage. They're probably going to be using derivatives. So it gets more complicated. But in the 40 act space, what, what our listeners would just know is mutual funds. What are some of the things we'd look to to kind of evaluate who um, is best in this space? at doing that work that would be really impossible for a retail investor to do and outside of our normal scope other than doing the due diligence on the managers. Yeah, no, and, and we have several managers that we would work with in that 40, you know, the mutual fund space, the liquid mutual fund space. And, you know, you, you want to have teams that have been around, you know, that this is a tough space. It's illiquid. The funds are all down, you know, they're down 15, 20%, something like that. And so at this point, you know, you're entering into something where you really do need expertise in those fund managers. They have to have been through it before and, and know exactly what to look for. They can really analyze the covenants of each individual security, um, uh, you know, and, and so I would say it's, it's experience, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's staying power, it's liquidity um, and, and all of those things. And, and ultimately, I, we tend to shy away from, you know, th this isn't something we're swinging for the fences necessarily on. I mean, we, we we are looking at this at a pretty level-headed approach. I'm not looking for a triple C credit only or anything like that. I want a manager that's going to be at the, on the upper end of bad, <laughs> on the upper end of, of junk, uh, you know, in that space. Um, so th those are the things, you know, higher, a little higher quality, a lot of expertise, those things. Um, I think that what you just said is probably even true in like the corporate debt markets that within high yield, some of the least bad um, in the in the junk space and some of the least good in the high quality space represent kind of better opportunities. But again, having to make that kind of individual bottom up determination is so important, uh, particularly with the uncertainty right now around the macro uh, environment that we're in. Um, I, I would add too, for, for those that are 
interested in our interest in structured credit. We've done really substantial due diligence in some of the manager partners that we're working with. And, and it's not just the experience um, in, in securitized credit. It's this experience in securitized credit through market cycles. And I think that the great financial crisis was a, a, a time in which you had not only fundamental vulnerability, but you had technical dislocations. And, and that's what Brian and I experienced. It, Brian, in particular, um, became really uh, gifted with high-yield municipals and, and did well for his clients out of the high-yield municipal space in 2009. But see, that was, that was a technical dislocation combined with fundamental vulnerabilities that had to be understood. In structured credit, manage, the structured credit space has exploded over the last 10 years. Managers who didn't necessarily go through the financial crisis, I think, would be less appealing by not having had that experience with, with both the technical and fundamental backdrop in the, in the space. Would, does that make sense, Brian? Yeah, it definitely does. And, that, and that's an that's a, that's a important, important factor of it all. And, and like you said, it's in these environments, whether it's an 08, 09, or, or this you know, March, basically, of 20, um, you basically just have baby thrown out with the bathwater. And so what we're looking for is to sift through what was thrown out um, that didn't deserve to be and, and stick with that kind of quality. So those are the managers that we, we work with that have that kind of experience. Well, um, Dave, instead of toy switching gears before I go to Robert about some of the emerging markets issues and, and Julian with some of the equity areas, I think that uh, illiquidity has been a theme of ours all year. It's uh, probably more so for me right now than even it was four months ago. And, and you look um, into middle market lending and, and you look at some of the things we're doing with manager selection there, uh, both on the collateralized loan space direct lending, and then, and then even real estate as a sort of um, different asset class, but related in the fact that it, it is offering access to an investment class without daily liquidity that brings in a different type of investor. It brings in a more sophisticated investor, but also one who's not able to hit a sell button on a given day so easily. Uh, so obviously, there's plenty of fundamental questions around lending to businesses right now. I mean, half the businesses in the country aren't even open as we're sitting here talking, although many are getting ready to reopen. But that trickles down to real estate as well. Um, it's hard to, for an office building, a retail uh, space, uh, industrial space, to be collecting rent when the businesses are themselves maybe not even operating or operating at full freight. Uh, what are your thoughts on opportunity versus risk in real estate and in um, direct lending and collateralized loans? But I, again, I'm separating this from uh, like a publicly traded REIT. I'm more talking about it, let's say, in a kind of alternative asset class environment. Sure. Uh, and uh, you and Brian talked uh, about the uh, technicals uh, and around the middle of March, uh, as we had seen that we started to have a uh, a full-fledged liquidity crisis on top of a uh, looming economic recession. And a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of these mutual funds and a lot of these ETFs that hold some of these assets that are not so liquid, whether they be on the real estate side, the security, securitized side, or on the credit side, you started to see some serious dislocations and the bid-ask spread that a lot of these securities, uh, uh, you know, were, were showing on the screen, essentially. So, like I mean, just to look at an investment grade, uh, investment grade bonds, where uh, which which will, which is supposed to be, you know, uh, very liquid, very tight, very stable asset class. Uh, you had you had spreads, uh, so the spread of the uh, what that investment those investment grade bonds were yielding relative to treasuries were high, but also with the bid ask spread. So if you were actually trading uh, an investment grade bond, the you know. Uh, as, as far as you were offering, uh, you're, you're, you're buying and selling, that that, would, that that little spread was significantly higher than is justified uh, by, by what that level of yield was. So we, we started seeing that across all asset classes. And essentially, if you're in a, uh, in a more liquid type of trading vehicle, that's something that you would have gotten impacted with a lot more than some of the uh, private structures that David is talking about. So we have, we have many managers we, we use that are within a, a private structure 
that are not susceptible to that sort of uh, those sort of outflows and those markdowns that uh, that could happen in a more daily uh, intraday traded vehicle. So, uh, I mean, on the middle market side, I mean, we have a manager uh, who's taking uh, opportunities uh, in middle market loans. Obviously, they're loans to pri- uh, to uh, private companies, uh, private companies that have uh, are earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization of around ten to fifty million, and uh, they're you know they're typically making loans that are more senior. So, if there was ever a default or something. That uh, that borrower would be first on that pecking order in order to uh, you know to to collect any recovery, and we've seen uh, you know we we we've seen some stability there as far as uh, good collateral pools are concerned, and um, the, those managers those loans aren't traded to uh, there's not really a secondary market for those loans, so a manager in that asset class. Uh, they're going to be. They're, it's going to be tough to be tactical and opportunistic, but what we have seen them doing is adding to uh, BDCs, business development companies, where the uh, where it, which is a publicly traded vehicle, where the underlying you know underlying securities are middle market loans, but they typically have more leverage, uh, and you know as I mentioned, they're they're publicly traded, so those have, have sold off quite a bit. Uh, relative to their private counterparts, the manager we used was down uh, about three to four percent in Q1, where the uh, publicly traded vehicles that use more leverage and are liquid were down uh, were down over twenty percent. So that manager is actually, you know, using a small allocation to buy some of those publicly traded vehicles that have sold off quite a bit to I take think, advantage of some that, opportunity. I think the BDCs overall that you refer to. We're probably on average down closer to fifty percent, but but a lot of that is because they're at such a big discount to their own NAV, and their NAVs only get updated quarterly, so it's a little hard to get a mark to market. But in terms of the broad spectrum of BDCs, to draw that contrast you're drawing versus um, the entities that that uh, hold these loans without leverage on top. Um, it, it, there may be as much as a 50% difference between how both structures might have performed in Q1. Yes, even, that al- although, although both yeah. have, have recovered quite a bit in April. Right, right, exactly. And yeah, that max drawdown is, a, is around that number. And it's, uh, it's, per, it's, it's pretty stark contrast from how, uh, you know, our manager did and where they're, they're not those – the, the vehicle itself is not being priced on a day-to-day basis. is not susceptible to, uh, you know, to outflows. It, so it's really important. Structure, ma- at the end of the day, structure matters. And it's really important to be aware uh, that the, the liquidity you're offering your investors is, uh, you know, is married to the liquidity of the underlying assets. Well, I, I think that these... Um these vehicles represent great opportunity and and yet a lot of it it's important for us to say is not based on just the belief that the the world will keep on turning although i maintain the belief that the world will keep on turning and it's not necessarily um tied to a particular timeline or outlook on economic recovery you know there's varying degrees of optimism and pessimism as to when the economy may recover and how much it may recover and I and I'm not I don't really think I'd be that attracted to the space if making money in this investment was dependent on us getting those things right. You know, whether it be equity or debt, it's gonna be very difficult to time and to fully grasp the uh, magnitude of what economic recovery will look like. I don't think you can find two economists out there that agree right now on either the shape or or timeline of the recovery. But to your point on structure. I think that if you assume most of the more negative economic scenarios, a significant amount of the senior debt space that's so dislocated in price and offering those yield spreads still still seem very attractive. Right. So, so as you're and you're talking about a structure as far as some of those uh, liquid structures that have been sold off. And- well, actually, in, in this case, I'm even just referring to the seniority of the debt. Uh, in the basic CLO space, that those tranches having 
the um, first payment rights, that, and not to mention if there is even a default, which you know we know the default rates um, for these triple A's going back to financial crisis were effectively about one percent, and and the recoveries were very very high out of distress events. So I'm kind of viewing it like um, even apart from the leverage side on, on the BDCs, just the underlying assets offer a, a uh, even in, you know, kind of a very difficult financial environment, um, ultimately offer a lot of uh, support on the back end. Just on a, on a fundamental basis. And, and absolutely, if you, if you look at some of the prices, some of these securities are trading at relative to uh, fundamentals, uh, they're very attractive. And like David was talking about, uh, if you look at, you know, what some of these, uh, the, what the default rates that were priced in relative to realized defaults, uh, realized defaults ended up being uh, a percent or two. When I think at their maximum, some of these securities are pricing in like, uh, you know, 30% default uh, probability or, or something around that. So there, there can be quite a huge de- disparity. And when there is that disparity, there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity. <laughs> Forgive me. You have a couple opportunities here. You have defaults, uh, hopefully not being anywhere near what maybe had been priced, and then you have um, recovery out of defaults being so much greater than the than the risk being priced that you end up with with a pretty uh, good risk reward trade off, and then along the way, uh, cash flow carry and and other things to make the the asset class opportunistic. So I think that um, this represents something that we were mildly interested in pre COVID but are uh, more than mildly interested in uh, uh, coming out of COVID. And so um, it's a space we're watching carefully and the day is leading a lot of our, our research into. Um, Dale, let me come back to you on real estate. Um, I want to switch gears to go to Robert real quickly on, on emerging markets. And Robert, I'll let you kind of take the lead if you want to emphasize more the, the equity or the debt side. I guess um, probably more people are interested in the equity side, but I think the story in emerging markets debt in March is one that got absolutely no press, none that I've been able to find. Um, Even now, you're seeing like today, the Financial Times had a big story on CLOs, and certainly most financial press was covering the dislocations in the mortgage market and the corporate bond market. The Fed obviously paid a lot of attention there, as we saw with their TALF facility. But I saw very little coverage of what was happening in EM debt, but the, that world just went to hell and back and now has almost recovered all of that drawdown. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the dollar shortages, the dollar liquidity fears that are really so fundamentally important in our global economy, and then where you see some opportunity in the emerging market space. Yeah, sure. So the, the first part on the dollar shortages, I think, is a great place to start. So. What happens just for listeners sometimes is that in times of duress, uh, people around the world, not just U.S. citizens, but people all over, they want dollar denominated assets and dollars themselves. Uh, A lot of times foreign central banks have a hard time accessing those U.S. dollars to get to their, you know, their respective domestic banks and to their their citizens. Um, The Treasury and and our government did a great job addressing that really, really quickly in reestablishing what's called swap lines, dollar swap lines uh, across the world. Um, Swap lines were primarily used in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Some of them stayed on to major partner countries, Canada, the Swiss Bank, ECB as an example. Um, But a lot of them that were temporarily shut down or shuttered were reestablished. For emerging markets, the most notable reestablished swap lines are those to Brazil and Mexico. Okay. Um, they, They were, as I was looking through emerging markets, two of the countries that I thought would be perhaps most impacted, not just by the COVID issue, but probably more so by the falling oil prices, okay? Because it is kind of the perfect storm for uh, oil producers or countries in the EM world that are are net exporters or dependent upon higher oil prices. So with the access to the dollar lines, that gives them a little breathing room. Um, Oil prices coming down certainly hurts those countries, but it helps a lot of other countries as well. Um, and that's been amplified kind of, kind of twofold by this, this crisis because falling oil prices per, you know, helps the consumer in those places, which allows them potentially to uh, you know, buy other goods with their limited disposable income. So a good example of what we saw in India is that India 
might have been having some issues, um, but their oil prices came down significantly for the consumers. And what the government did over there is they were able to incrementally raise taxes a little bit on the oil side and the, on the energy side. So it's not going to hurt their budget as much to distribute aid to their citizens over there. So I thought that was kind of an interesting balance sheet mechanism for for India that happened as a result of you know the. the but is is the way is the way that oil prices affected different emerging market economies just as simple as differentiating commodity exporters from commodity importers? No, a- absolutely not. And I think a lot of it kind of comes back to how much do they have in dollar reserves. It just happens that a lot of the exporters, the the, the bigger ones, have more reserves. We think about you know the Russias, the Saudi Arabias. Swap lines weren't reestablished with them for. Not just that reason, but I think more of geopolitical and rather political concerns. Um, but no, it's not just that factor. It's going to be other things as well, like what else are they spending their money on domestically as well? Um, the countries that were struggling beforehand are going to be struggling more as a result of uh, falling oil prices if they're dependent upon that as their core source of revenue. Um, one other point where I think oil is really crucial to this whole discussion is, is inflation. Right. So a lot of these emerging markets countries, and this will kind of feed into the bond side as well, that inflation is is either a major target, if not the only target for some of the, the, the central banks there. And with with oil prices coming down, which is a factor in how they measure inflation, that can give them some stimulative leeway to decrease rates. They're saying, hey, if inflation drops down a little bit, we can lower the, the Fed, Fed rates a little bit and provide some stimulus on the monetary side to, to the countries. So it helps a lot of those nations as well is what I'm what I'm seeing. Um, on, on the bond side, something you touched on that's absolutely fascinating is, um, and it's something we've been talking about for a long time, it's the, the countries versus companies differential out there. So I'm, I've, I've been looking at these, these various charts and things, um, looking at the, the slope versus the credit rating. You know, when, when you're looking at credits across different countries versus credits on, on the company basis, there's, there's not much projected growth. From, from the countryside. And a lot of, a lot of the, the spread and or the slope rather for um, that I would wanna take advantage of is in, in the company specific arena. And that's just on the bond side. And more than ever, I think the bond side is informing our view, our, our consistent view on emerging markets is that you don't wanna be touching these, these country ETFs. You wanna be very selective and go in and find the companies that are gonna survive this with balance sheet strength. And and would you apply that principle differently in equity than you would in debt? Well, certainly. I think I think the debt side is none of it takes less research or more research, but I think the debt side takes quite a bit more unpacking. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the attention has been shifted away from it because people are saying, "Hey, I'm worried enough about you know the, the collateralized markets in the United States. I, I don't have time to look at the EM side, even though I think there's some great opportunities there. Very, very certainly." Um, People want to know more about the equity side. You know, they're they're looking for the easy buys, those Russia ETFs, the Saudi ETFs, the stuff that's going to hopefully not end up badly, but maybe it will down the road. Well, one of one of the things that um, I know that Daya Bryan and I have encountered in our meetings in New York over the years with our EM managers that that has always intrigued me, and it's not changed, is the country allocation that that most. EM equity investors on the passive side are so obsessed with, and even active side, their top-down focus, uh, the country concentration is just night and day different in an EM equity ETF than it is in an EM bond ETF. There, there's far greater country diversification in the bond side, and yet um, the, for the top-down folks, you end up with such a concentration in China, uh, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, these big exporter countries, largely from a certain Asian area, as opposed to on the debt side, it really does tend to capture a very different economic landscape, for good or for bad. But I think that your focus and what we've really believed in so strongly for over a decade now around bottom-up company performance driving EM equity is that um, you actually can do that. Right, you can actually analyze fundamentals and growth and return on invested capital in uh, individual companies. Where on the debt side, it's so much a currency story, and and therefore macroeconomic. And so these really become very, very different asset classes, um, and even though there's some degree of overlap. Um, and and yet, I think that that the debt dislocations that were largely remedied, as you pointed out, with these swap lines the Fed brought in, 
um, it points to vulnerability in the global economic system. Uh, and it makes it almost laughable when people talk about the dollar losing its status as reserve currency um, when, when most of these countries apparently cannot get out of bed with, without having access to dollars by which they've denominated their own overly indebted balance sheets. So, uh, it, it, you know, these things are true when we're not in a crisis, but I guess some of them become more true in the midst of a crisis. Um, why don't I switch up to, to Julian? Because I know a lot of people want to talk on the, the stock side of things, and we've talked a great deal, Julian, already and throughout the last, let's say, five weeks as we kind of began some of our repositioning after the really violent sell-off of March. Um, we wanted to rid ourselves of any of the companies we felt were vulnerable and, and increase our positions where we thought there was most severe dislocation and then also adding to the quality at great yields of some of those more stable companies, lower beta and, and um, just very reliable multi-decade type dividend stories. And so we've spoken about the barbell approach of, of having kind of one side be much lower beta, but great companies, and the other side being also great companies, but just a little bit more opportunistic. So on that opportunistic side of that quote-unquote barbell, that maybe aren't the consumer staples names, maybe aren't even the healthcare names, which have continued to really do very well for us, one of our biggest sectors. But uh, again, I know it's a little constricting when we can't go into individual companies, but financials and energy continue to be two heavier weights for us. They've both performed quite well here in April, but we're among the most beaten up in March. Uh, talk about our convictions in financials and energy. Yeah, I, I guess it's, um, it's been a really interesting uh, first three, three, four months. And, uh, and you know, we, uh, we had a great opportunity in March with the dislocation um, in the market to, um, to move things a little bit and, and uh, seize opportunities. And um, I guess we, uh, we haven't really changed too much our allocation really in terms of sectors. It's, I think we just increased the quality of the, of the names we could own because we were given this uh, opportunity uh, by, you know, when there was this huge sell-off in particular in the second half of, uh, of March. So um, I guess since then, it's, uh, it's amazing to see how much the market has recovered. And you know, if you look at the s and now, we are like, down 10% on the year and year on year, we're actually almost flat. We are down 2%. So, you know, would you, it doesn't feel like we're flat from last year, but that's pretty much where, where it is at the moment. But that's, that's really the market picture. If you look sector by sectors and to answer your question specifically, clearly some sectors, you know, that are more cyclical like energy and, and financials have been hit a bit harder. Um, and, you know, I've seen some pretty serious dislocation in, in March with, you know, stocks that we like, that we think are, you know, been graded on payers, you know, being down more than, I think, 50% from, from peak. So, uh, um, and that's, you know, uh, if you look at the old sector, uh, for instance, you know, people, um, you know, just write down these companies because they are unable to uh, cover their cash flows in the short term, but you have to uh, to look at, you know, their hedging program, you know, or maybe trading in May or June futures at uh, 10 or, or, or $20. But uh, most of, you know, the all majors, they will have hedged their 2020 production in the, in the 50s or in the 60s. So it's really irrelevant to them. Uh, then you have to look worry about more what's their hedging uh, for 2021, 2022. Um, uh, but there's other things they can do to, uh, you know, adjust to the environment. They all can in CapEx. And they are managing the uh, you know the short term uh, disruption, but you know if you look at the long term, um, we are not past peak uh, con maximum consumption. That's clearly uh, you know a lot of uh, oil oil demand is is here to, uh, here to stay. So it's been disrupted for a quarter or two, maybe three, but it will come back. People will go back to driving, will go back to flying, um, and and um, so that's just you know one sector. In, to talk about the energy in particular. I plan, I plan to do my part to help with oil consumption by resuming flying again as soon as I uh, possibly can. Um, uh, I, and I'm, I bet some of you plan to do your part uh, with driving. I think some of you like driving maybe more than I do. But um, So it's oil demand that has to come back on. 
and and then these companies uh, have maintained their ability to manage their their challenged financials through the down period. Then we get out of the down period, and we see greater opportunity. Um, talk about the pipeline side versus the oil majors. Um, the majors are are complicated because many people, um, and I don't I don't think you guys would believe how many inquiries I've gotten from clients, but also even non clients. Um, expressing utter confusion and mystery around um, how well these oil majors have done over the last couple of weeks, while oil has, according to their screen, gone from twenty-eight dollars to ten dollars, or or uh, allegedly negative forty, you know, last Monday or whatever. And and of course, we know that there is both the refiner story, the downstream story, and the production story that makes an oil major an oil major. But the midstream side is pretty peer to its business of transportation and storage. And if there's no oil coming out of the wells, they're not going to have much oil to move. Um, so why do we still like the midstream energy names uh, that we like? Well, first, uh, oil is just part of, the, part of the business. The midstream guys are doing, you know, big portion is also uh, gas. So it's not, you know, all, all linked to oil uh, only. So gas keep moving around and and also the way, I mean, you have to look at them as more, you know, owners of, of the pipelines that are they're renting to these majors that, you know, that needs to move the, their production around. So, you know, the, the way there is, is are they going to be able, like a landlord, to collect the rents from, from, um, from these guys? And, uh, and they have, you know, long-term contracts. So the risk is more, I guess, the liquidity or, or the, you know, the bankruptcy risk of the clients. And... And uh, I am, you know, from what, you know, we read from the transcripts or the presentations, um, they are, you know, they're not seeing any of this uh, materializing at the moment. So there's really, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's tough for them as well in this uh, environment, but I guess they're less exposed than the all majors uh, being, uh, you know, uh, renters of the, uh, of the pipelines, basically. And, and but so speak to that, and, and I'll make a comment, and maybe you can chime in on it. Um, when when people refer to the credit risk and financial risk of some of these counterparties, some of the maybe weaker players in shale, there's got to be some names that are going to end up going bankrupt, and it's debatable how many it will end up being. We don't know what governmental support there will be. We don't know where bank lines can be extended. There's a lot of financial flexibility that could change people's uh, negativity that exists within capital markets. But if you take out that bottom quartile of weakness in shale, um, and then you look to just sort of the higher quality uh, producers, even those that are going to themselves have really impaired businesses for a while, doesn't that make up the entirety of the counterparty universe for the better pipeline companies, the larger ones, again, without mentioning names, yeah. Yeah. the two that we're invested in. But and so to the degree, Julian, that there does end up being distress with some space of the producers, you get creditors to come in, you get acquirers to come in, e even if you get banks that just say, I now want to own pipeline, or excuse me, wells and rigs, which sounds like a pretty stupid business for a bank to be in. But even if they came in, don't they need pipelines to take the stuff away? No, that's right. I guess they might have to speak to someone else instead of talking to the management. Now they speak to the administrator who was running that company when he went bankrupt, but he'll still be there and they'll still have to move their, um, you know, their, um, their gas or oil around. And I th one, I think, thing that was surprising, um, I was just on a call yesterday on real estate and, and um it feels like I mean, they were talking about, you know, the cruise liners being able to finance themselves uh, at this moment. And that's a big difference with the great financial crisis in 2008. If you think about the cruise line industry, like this is probably the, the least, you know, the, the worst industry you could be in at the moment. And they're able to refinance. And, and uh, <laughs> what's surprising as well is that the bookings for 2021 cruises are up from 2019. If uh, that's a, a study that was done by UBS, so uh, yeah, for sure in the short term, it's really awful. But even industries like that, that are, I guess people think are doomed at the, at the moment, you know, are, you know, say, can, can get financing. Yeah, Brian, are you going to go on any cruises in 2021? 
No, I'm not. And uh, full disclosure, I've never been on a cruise. So uh, so that's not saying much. So if I went on one, it would be 100% increase. But uh, no, I, no plans there. I, I agree with your energy comments. I'm just going to throw in there, you know, the, the pipeline space and, the, and I would say two things. There's a couple of names that we own. And so if there's carnage in the area, that you know, the, the, those types of balance sheets survive and thrive, they can take advantage of, of lower prices and, and, and build out their network even more. And then the other thing is when demand actually does come back, and I'm I'm pretty sure that since the world is still spinning, the demand will eventually come back once the economy reopens. Um, you know, a lower priced commodity moving through a pipeline is not necessarily a bad thing. The, the, the cost of moving it through the pipeline is about the same. And technically, demand should pick up a little. Some things a little cheaper. Maybe people consume a little bit more of it, which would be a little bit more revenue for those pipeline companies. So, so two, just two kind of closing comments on the energy space. Well, and I also think Julian's point about um, natural gas, uh, in the case of the, the names that we own that we consider to be of a higher credit quality and, and uh, possess stronger financial metrics, which I would agree is really important right now for people that are going to be invested in midstream energy. Uh, the beauty of what we did, where I think we got a little bit lucky, was that it wasn't like the bad quality was sold off dramatically and the high quality was only sold off a little. Like it was all sold off the same. And so we got to, to buy the high quality at the distressed prices that the low quality were, were residing. Um, and, and so to me, I think that it was a really good trade to, to, on the risk reward calculus. But that natural gas component, Julian, it, that you spoke to, it isn't just that they also have natural gas. They predominantly do natural gas, like 66% of revenues, give or take, you know, and I'm trying to use round numbers across the couple of companies. Um, so the natty gas world and the crude oil world have got to be d differentiated. In some cases, they're competitors of one another, not just complements, to the degree that, of course, it's shale, the producers. You, you, you could very, you're, you're talking about drilling in the same rocks. And so there's going to be uh, overlap at the financial, you know, strength of that apparatus that exists, whether it's Permian Basin, Marcellus, uh, you, you know, the different geographical regions. But I really do think that the economic cash flow model for transporting natural gas should be thought of as a different business than all the distresses we see in crude oil right now. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, totally agree. I mean, I, I think it's just the way a lot of things trade at the moment. You know, it's like uh, MLPs and some of these names they've seen as all proxies and people, you know, uh, see all price futures at 10 or negative and they think, okay, what do I sell? And these are traders, they're not investors. They don't really think about the business and what it means owning these cash flows to perpetuity. So that's really what we're focused on is like, okay, what cash flow are they going to generate this year when it's, you know, in this environment that's quite tough. And then when we get out of this in next year and then next year and to perpetuity. And that's, and that's investing. That's very different from trading. Now, Dea, before we get ready to wrap up, and uh, forgive me for throwing a curveball at you here, cause, but I think you're pretty good on your feet, so you'll do just fine. If we're going to talk about opportunistic investing and the spaces we like coming out of this COVID period, um, you know, we've sat here today and talked about structured credit um, securitized lending, real estate, uh, emerging markets, energy. Um, most people that I, I'm hearing from are doing the thing of looking at sheltering in place and looking at um, some of the various kind of obvious changes, potential changes in American society, saying, hey, it looks like uh, uh, streaming services are really going to be big. Be, and, and it looks like... Um, home workout type companies, you know, uh, home video companies, uh, for example, the type of tool that we're talking on right now, you know what I'm saying? Um, why would that thinking not necessarily be as logical of an investment strategy as some might think? Well, it's for the, uh, for the, for the very simple reason that the market is a discounting mechanism. And um, the, it's, it, the market is quicker than those folks that I, that you know we talk to uh, think it is. If you look at the uh, the prices of a lot of these uh, you know work from home type companies that have done well, 
you can see that those prices have increased substantially and their multiple is significantly greater uh, than when we started the year. So a lot of those expectations have already been baked in and the, your returns going forward uh, you know, are a little un, you know, unclear. So if you're trying to make it a trade, I think that you know, that trade's already gone. I mean, but if you have an underlying thesis why this company is going to be a long-term compounder and you're going to want to be stay invested in this company for the next 5, 10, uh, you know, 20 years, that's, that's a different story. Uh, but trying to trade around this and, you know, I mean, I mean at the end of the day, you're, you're just too late for a lot of those trades. Well, and, and Robert, I'm seeing a couple of the quote unquote stay at home companies uh, trading at 82 times earnings if they're cheap. Some are at 100, 150 times earnings. Is there a chance that not only um, could the thesis be wrong, but that the, the multiple uh, could contract even with the thesis being right? to a place where, where these might represent some of the higher risk stocks in the market, not, not the higher opportunity, but the highest risk. Yeah, yeah. so I think I would, I would certainly agree with Dave in that these are, these are trades and there, there's no question that so much of the, the flow into this was just with the herd. I mean, we, we, we know of a kind of a major company, one that we might be using right now that had um, flows not only into that name, but also a, a ticker that was uh, conspicuously close to it, right? So people were just buying these companies based upon what they thought the ticker would be with no homework. And so the inflows inflated the prices, uh, you know, helped those, those multiples, so to speak. But then what do you think happens when the herd leaves it? What do you think happens when people go back to work and they say, hey, I, you know, I'm going to unwind this, this you know, smart trade that they made, so to speak. You're, you're subject to the whims of that, uh, that technical flow, so to speak. And that's not at all what we want to be a part of. Um, these, these companies, many of them are startups. And they're not going to cease being startups after this whole thing passes. Okay. You know, what happens in economics is that if someone creates a profitable enterprise and they create margins, competitors come in to seize those margins and they make it a competitive industry. Do, do you think for one moment that, you know, one company is going to dominate the video conferencing world? No, they're going to learn from this. They're going to improve, but their competitors also learn from what they did wrong and are going to, to scale up and do a good job. There's major profitable companies in that space that are going to do probably a better job than these smaller players that everyone flocked to through this whole mm -hmm. situation. So I would be looking for, just like in the, the energy sector, the sustainable companies with balance sheets to continue making investments through this period, not just to be, you know, having an elevated stock price, essentially. Well, and it's, it's one of the reasons, you know, I, I agree that there is such thing as first mover advantage out there, but, but I have to say that um, in, in this, kind of transitory period of sheltering in place, uh, you know, I think there's reasonable debate as to how much, you know, are people going to all go back to work and what uh, at once and what will the different transitions like in society be? I'm not sure that those things are easy to bake into a multiple right now. I think there's a lot of debate as to what really paradigmatic shift changes we're actually going to see. I can tell you this, um, if people think that that video office stuff is going to be the wave of the future, uh, we're not doing too many more of these podcasts by video because we're going back to work. Amen. We're going Amen. back to our office. There we you, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's our business. That's and 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 our clients want to sit in front of us, and we want to sit in front of our clients. We want to sit together around our table, talking markets, talking stocks, doing what we do. The video thing has been a fine stopgap. But I would use that just as an example about a whole lot of things that I'm not sure they represent as much of a sea change. And if they do, great. But to your point, all that means they're going to invite more competition. I can't think of one short of, and this is not a new company. This is a 20 plus year old story of the largest e-commerce company in the world. I can't think of one that has a moat that really will keep competitors out of their business you know, to the extent people are really excited about some of the home exercise companies and the video streaming and video conferencing and a lot of those things, I got to say, I just think they're begging for more competition, which should compress multiples, not enhance already elevated multiples. So I will stick to our theories that opportunities coming out of COVID on a risk adjusted basis. I like the themes we've all talked about today far more than the the headline stories that might seem to have a bit more of a consumer bad orientation to them right now while we're all 
locked down at home. Um, okay, let, let's just do it real quickly and wrap up. Uh, Brian, 20 seconds of any closing comments, and then I'll go to you, Julian, you, Robert, you, Daya, 20 seconds each, and then I'll wrap us out, up. Sure. So I'll go, I'll go backwards, forward. So on, on some of those names, we're talking about video teleconferencing and things. It's, what we're doing is managing wealth for people to, to, to achieve goals. If there's ideas that seem sexy or, or neat or, or catchy because of something that's happening in the world, that's fine. Is it a place where you can put a sizable amount of money and derive a predictable rate of return at a multiple of 100 times? It isn't. And so the things that we are talking about are time tested and uh, geared more towards kind of those longer term results. The one thing I'll say on energy too is, is you know, it is it is up um, more than the market from the lows considerably, 25 versus 15 or so, um, uh, in over the last month at least, and and some of those CDS spreads and some of those metrics we look at as far as uh, risk in that in that uh, in that market are, are lower. So long story short is, um, you know, there's opportunities in all of this. Uh, maybe being thrown out with the bathwater and a huge market dislocation is where we have upgraded quality and equities and where we are looking for those hidden gems in the, in the fixed income markets. Excellent stuff. One of the things I love uh, about Brian as my partner is he and I have the same definition of 20 seconds. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Julian, what, what kind of comments do you have just in terms of all the things we touched on today just to kind of represent a closing comment? Uh, I, I just, you know, I want to talk about equities again. And I, it's a very interesting time, you know, with on one hand valuation that looks very elevated. Uh, but, and, you know, a lot of friends, people calling me who say for the first time, oh, I want to short the market. And it's interesting, like people are talking about, you know, shorting the market with never they need before. And they actually, the short is pretty high actually at the moment. And on the other hand, you have the Fed and, and the Treasury, you know, staff, you know, you know, putting everything out there to support, you know, um, risk, uh, basically risk taking and asset prices. So, you know, uh, I think it's uh, you know, a very exciting time to be doing this job and, and looking at all these companies. And, um, and I just can't wait to see when they can start guiding and talk about the normal world again. Well, um, I, I agree. Fa fascinating times. Great, great comments. So much more. We'll get to elaborate on there in the in the days, weeks, months ahead. Robert, close us with your final comments. Yeah, I mean, situations like this create, of course, massive dislocations and perhaps speed through to some good investing opportunities. But what is really important for for me to always remember is that fundamentals matter, and they matter more in times of crisis. And so that's uh, something we stick to. Very, very good. And Daya. Yeah, and uh, I know you know you've spoken about it before. Is and uh, some of these paradigmatic uh, changes. I don't know how things will might permanently change in the future. I think uh, some people won't change, and some people will, and uh, maybe some industries will be a little bit different. But all that doesn't mean that it's bad for markets. Uh, you know, markets adjust as they always have been, and entrepreneurs adjust, and they they find a way to you know make profit and uh, and be able to have successful business models despite challenges. So, so all, you know, it, you, it's very difficult to say if one thing's good or bad. All you can do is really consult the historical record and realize that uh, you know, mar markets tend to uh, overcome challenges in the long run. Well, and, and I'll piggyback off that in my closing comment. Um, and, and, I, and I appreciate everything you guys have said. And hopefully our listeners know, and more important than that, our clients really know how like-minded we all are, how aligned we are in the way we're approaching all these things. Uh, my view about um, paradigmatic shift is not stubborn. It is not that I don't think that the, there's change. It's just that I don't think change is a change. I think change is a constant. I think that there's always been change and there always will be. And so it's very hard for me to feel um, stressed about changes. It, it, what I am stressed about is that we may misread changes or that we may misapply them. Um, and I guess you have less of a chance of doing that the less you try to, to kind of uh, speculate on where entirely you know, culturally transformative type events may be happening. But Dea mentioned that markets adjust, and, and he used the word in there, entrepreneurs. And, and I'm going to focus on that word to wrap us up. To the extent that there's uncertainty right now in the health pandemic, the policy response, 
the impact of fiscal and monetary stimulus, the timeline of different cities, counties, states, not to mention federal guidelines coming off to reopen the economy. Okay, there's a wide variance of possibilities of things that could go more right than expected and more wrong than expected. And it creates a very complicated milieu for us. And we do not have a bullish view on the, let's say, S&P 500 per se, um, nor a bearish view. We're anticipating range-bound markets as we kind of uh, struggle through this with varying degrees of opportunity within that, some of those opportunity sets that we've talked about here today. But the one issue that is, I think, really a permanent bullish perspective from the Bonson Group is the idea that the entrepreneur adjusts, that the human spirit is accustomed to adversity and accustomed to doing what it has to do to survive and thrive through adversity. And any viewpoint that requires us to short the human spirit is not a viewpoint we're going to subscribe to. It's not going to happen. Uh, there will be challenges in the economic price level. There will be challenges in unemployment. There will be challenges in macroeconomics. And there will be individual companies that don't make it. And there will be individual companies that do really well out of it. But what there will not be is a redefinition of entrepreneurship whereby the entrepreneur becomes unable to accommodate the new realities that they have to face on a day-by-day -day basis. Innovation and that sort of indomitable reality of the human spirit is something I will go along the rest of my investing career. I hope that's helpful for you to hear. I appreciate the uniformity and viewpoint out of my colleagues and partners here from the Bonson Group. We wish you and yours a very good, safe, and free rest of your week. Thanks for listening to the Dividend Cafe.